I think most people, you ought to take opportunities, not when something's at the top of its game, but when you have an opportunity to make an impact. Business of Architecture, episode 259. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get free instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm, which as you know, is our focus here on the show. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. I also want to thank our second sponsor for today's show, Sage Glass. You've probably heard of them. They're the manufacturer of highly intelligent dynamic glass. Sage Glass tints automatically to customize the user experience inside the building to reduce glare, manage heat, all while maintaining fantastic views of the unobstructed views of the outdoors. You can visit sageglass.com to see for yourself the remarkable technology behind this glass. Now, I want you to imagine if you could double, triple, or even quadruple your word of mouth referrals. What if word about your firm spread so far and wide that people were lining up at your door. And what if you could do that without spending a single dime on advertising or marketing? Now, this may sound like a nightmare to you. You're fine where you are and you don't want any more work and you don't want to make a larger impact. Well, that's great. However, because you're listening to this podcast, I'm guessing you're someone who wants to learn and to grow and you're always looking for a better way of doing things. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's guest who comes from an industry far, far away from architecture and design. I think some of the most powerful business breakthroughs we can have as architects is by looking at other industries and modeling their success, seeing how we can apply their lessons to the business of architecture and design. So today I bring you a story about baseball. Known as the P.T. Barnum of baseball, Jesse Cole is the founder of Fans First Entertainment. Shortly after graduating from college in 2007, Jesse became the general manager of a minor league baseball team, the Gastonia Grizzlies. When Jesse signed on, the Gastonia Grizzlies had no sponsors, no money, and few fans. He miraculously turned around the team by the end of the first season. They were playing to sold out crowds. Absolutely amazing. In 2014, Jesse and his wife took on another challenge by opening a new baseball team in Savannah, Georgia, which they named the Savannah Bananas. As you can imagine, there was a bit of local outcry over this unorthodox and odd name uh, when so many baseball teams are named after tigers and lions and ferocious animals. Well, after he got past the local criticism of the strange name, Jesse knew he was onto something when the team launch date went viral on media around the world. Suddenly, thousands of people wanted a Savannah Bananas hat or t-shirt, and since then, the team plays to sold-out crowds. Now, imagine this, going from having a sparsely populated stadium to having game after game sold-out crowds, a remarkable feat. So Jesse sums up his success very simply. He says, be different. He's been featured on MSNBC, NPR, As a matter of fact, before we recorded this interview, he was just hopping off an interview with NPR. I'm sure this interview will be better. Uh, ESPN and other media outlets. He just released a book, Find Your Yellow Tux, which I highly recommend. He promotes his mantra of, if it's normal, do the exact opposite. And you'll find out what I mean in today's show. Jesse perhaps has the most compelling message that I've ever heard about creating an amazing experience for your clients and how this can fuel your business. And since we are service-based business in architecture, I thought it was going to be very appropriate. Uh, There's so many connections we could make to what Jesse did, uh, infusing excitement and fun into his business. The lessons we can learn from that are many, and I'm sure you'll pick up on many that I didn't pick up on. So my hope for you is that this interview inspires you, helps you think differently about your practice, and ultimately helps you create a practice that is more impactful and profitable. Jesse, welcome to the business of architecture. Ah, excited to be here with you. So 
tell me, I just have to know, what was it? Let's go back to when you graduated from school, you were coaching, you decided that wasn't a fit for you, and you decided to get involved with the Gastonia Grizzlies. What made you take that decision? That seems like a huge career turning point. Uh, it was a pretty much crazy decision that I took there. You know, I played baseball my whole life, hoped to play professionally, then tore everything in my shoulder. So that ended everything. And I got an email about an internship. And it was an unpaid internship working for this team in Gastonia, North, uh, Gastonia, North Carolina. And I took it. And actually, I was, I was an intern for two months. And then crazily, the owner offered me the job as the general manager of the team. And it was there that I learned that I loved absolutely loved playing baseball, but hated watching baseball. And I had to now sell people on coming to a game and watch baseball. And so it was a really interesting thing because I showed up in Gastonia. I found out that the team was only drawing 200 fans a game. There was only $268 in the bank account. And we had three full-time employees. And the team had lost $100,000 the previous year. That was my first day as a general manager at 23 years old. And I realized I was getting myself into something pretty crazy. And we had to change the game and make it about something other than just baseball. Sounds like a winning proposition. <laughs> it was a challenge. You know, I, I think most people, you want know, to take opportunities, not when something's at the top of its game, but when you have an opportunity to make an impact. And I was glad this was the worst performing team in the country. And we couldn't go any further down. So it was a great opportunity to start. And how did you hear about that opportunity? So I got an email about an internship. So I took the internship and then, uh, you know, I just went with it. The owner offered me a job as a general manager. So it was only about 45 minutes away from my school at Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So was this a, a mass email that this owner had sent out or was it directed directly at you and maybe some other people? I'm curious how that happened. Yeah, they were sending it out to different people that were interested in going to sports. So it was probably a, a group of people and I was one of the crazy ones to actually respond. Okay. So was this, this was before, uh, this was after you had already done a little bit of coaching, yeah. right? Or actually gotten involved with, with the idea of coaching because you couldn't play anymore. You said, okay, cool. I'm going to coach. So you got this, uh, did you get the email while you were at that other team as an assistant coach? Yeah. So I was coaching at the Cape Cod league and I received the email and, uh, I said, you know, there's a difference in coaching when you're coaching a team, especially if you're an assistant coach, you can't make much of an impact. You're kind of just watching on the sidelines. I think I was working with outfielders, which really mean it's not even really a job. And so when they said this opportunity to be an intern and then potentially grow to something else, I was like, all right, I can make an impact here. And uh, when I had the opportunity to be the GM, it was like, this is a no brainer. I get to run the show at 23 years old. Interesting. So what was the actual internship for in, in that? What was the stated purpose of that internship? To sell tickets and sell sponsorship. I, they gave me a phone book and put it on my desk the first day. They said, start making phone calls. And that was the extent of my training. So I started going through the phone book and just calling companies and seeing if they were interested in sponsoring the team or buying tickets. And crazily, a lot of people end up saying yes. And that's how the owner gave me the opportunity to become a general manager because I was having success making sales. Okay. So how long did it take from the time when you were there making sales to the time that you had the opportunity to jump into the G general manager position? Two months of being unpaid. So two months of being unpaid. Wow. What, what, was, go what was going through your head, Jesse, when you were, you were doing that? Did you have a family or wife to support at this time? No, I was 23 years old, okay. uh, just fresh out of college. My family was up in Massachusetts. I was down south. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I was able to save money in college. And I, I, had a, I had a full scholarship to play baseball. So I was able to save some money. And I was like, hey, let's just see it. And, and I'm, I believe in hunger. That's one of our core values here with fans first is being hungry. And uh, I was hungry. I, I wanted to find out, could I be successful doing this? And I put the same effort into sales as I did playing baseball back in the day. So that's, that's where I went from there. And it was, a, it was a wild ride. But here's the funny thing is I went into to become the GM of Gastonia. We had no money, only $268 in the bank account. So I went another three months without paying myself because there was no money. What do you think was your secret to, to being able to have an impact in the sales, right? I mean, you can't just put anyone into that position and expect they're going to sell sales. So you were, you were selling tickets and you were selling sponsorships. What, what do you think was the key to your success? Energy and belief. You know, I talk about if you want to be a good salesperson, you got to have energy. You got to have enthusiasm because if people don't feel that off you, then they're not going to want to buy from you. I had this unbelievable, crazy energy, but more than anything, I believed in it. I believed baseball was long, slow, and boring, but I believed what we were trying to do with dancing players, grandma beauty pageants, nonstop promotions. I believed that the ballpark was going to be electric and be a lot of fun. Most people didn't because they were used to seeing 200 people at the ballpark. 
but I convinced them. And, you know, fortunately, a lot of those partnerships that bought tickets then stayed with us for many, many years because they saw what we were trying to build. Okay. So during that initial two months, though, you didn't have any of the, uh, you didn't have any of the entertainment happening, right? It was just the, the same old quote unquote kind of boring baseball team. <laughs> yes, it was. But I was talking about what we wanted to do and what our vision was. Okay. And it wasn't just selling baseball. And this is what we want to do. And this is why it's going to be exciting. And, uh, you know, I believed it. So I, I was probably selling a little too early on it because I hadn't seen it. But I, I believe you need, uh, it's, it's not seeing to believe it, it's believing it to see it. So you were selling them on a vision of what could be in the past. And for you, it was, it was crystal clear, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I just imagine a circus. I mean, I imagine I was like, here, how can I sell baseball? I'm a guy who played baseball my whole life and I can't watch it anymore. Like I said, there's a difference between playing and watching. I was bored and I knew what was going to happen. I knew the exciting things that happened during a game, like the bunts, the steals, the hit and run, the signals, and I was bored. So if I was going to sell that to people that don't like baseball, I had to make it much bigger and much more about the entertainment. And everyone, that was the biggest thing we heard when we met with people is like, hey, I don't like baseball. And I would say, perfect. You'll love our games. And they were like, what? I'm like, because it's not about baseball. And so, you know, I believe every company, whatever they're doing, find that mirror moment. And to me, it was that baseball was frustrating, slow, long, and boring. So what frustrates you about a business and go the opposite way? And that's why we try to make it more fun, more entertaining, nonstop, you know, promotions. And that's what you've done. So, so Ken was the owner of the Gastonia Grizzlies. Is that correct? Yes, correct. The name of Ken. Okay. And when you came on board for those two months, did you pitch Ken on the idea of like what you were selling? Did he even know that you were talking up the team and the plans you had? Or when did that enter into the picture when you sold him on the vision? You know, it's a funny story. You know, Ken is now one of my closest friends. He actually got ordained to marry my wife and I on our field a few years ago. That's how close Ken and I are. And I think it's a testament to his leadership as an owner of the team, he realized the team was struggling and he saw me with all this energy and excitement to doing something. And he said, let's roll with it. I, his best, the best leadership advice I learned from him was whenever I came up with an idea, I'd say, Ken, you know, what do you think about this? He would come back and say, Jesse, what do you think? And so he literally can me always come up and I was thinking and like an owner at 23 years old. So when I told him, we're going to have dancing players, grandma beauty pageants, I'm going to get in the dunk tank every game. We're going to put burgers inside a donut bun and serve them at our games. He goes, what do we have to lose? And in fact, we didn't have much, much to lose. And he gave me the opportunity to really be an owner or feel like one at 23 years old. So how are the donuts with burgers, by the way? <laughs> the, the donut burger, it sold very, very well. You know, it was, it was part of our, my whole belief, you know, you need to create attention. Attention beats marketing. So every single year we did a new food item. We did the donut dog with, we actually got eclair shaped donuts with a hot dog in the middle. I think I did a pizza burger with two slices of pizza and a burger, a taco dog, a waffle burger. I mean, we tried it all. And even to this day, one of our most famous items is our garbage can nachos, which is three orders of nachos, two cheeseburgers, two hot dogs, chili, chicken, nacho cheese, jalapenos, and now with the bananas, two bananas on the side. It's 3,500 calories. And we say it feeds a family of whatever. And it sells every single night at the ballpark. But again, it's just, you know, it's fun and, and people talk about it. Was there a moment, Jesse, when you're with the Gastonia Grizzlies, you're pushing, you have this vision in your head that it finally clicks and you say, hey, look, this is, this is actually happening. This is working. Tell me about that moment. The last game of the season, my first year, 2008, um, up on the roof. And the way the stadium is, you can go up on the roof and you can see all the cars coming in and the people. And it was a Sunday afternoon game. And to understand the industry, Sunday evening afternoons are like the worst attended games ever. I mean, they're bad. And I was standing up there at 5.30, an hour and a half before the game, and just watching cars come in. And the line was wrapping around onto the road. And I won't lie, I got emotional because the amount of time and the amount of you know, effort convincing people to believe in us and standing up there, I got emotional. I called my dad. I go, dad, you won't believe what's happening right now. And I was so proud and he was so proud and it was a moment I'll never forget. A season is a long time. What kept you, I'm just really curious, Jesse, what kept you going? Uh, you mentioned belief and enthusiasm is two of the strengths that help you make this happen. I want to focus in on that belief, right? It's so easy in this day and age to doubt, to doubt ourselves, to doubt our progress, to believe that something's going to happen when perhaps there's failure after failure. I remember reading in your book, right, when you announced, and we'll go ahead and we'll get back to this, but Savannah Bananas, you know, people talking about that's the worst name I've ever heard for a, a baseball team. You know, during that first season there with the Gastonia Grizzlies, man, what, what kept you going and not just saying, this is ridiculous, I'm throwing in the towel? 
fun. Man, you know, I, I think fun is such a cliche word, but I was having the time of my life. I was 23 years old, running a baseball team, coming up with ridiculous ideas, you know, like flatulence fun night and salute to underwear night and doing things that people were scratching their head and saying, you are crazy. It was fun. You know, I remember talking to the media regularly and they were like, where are you come off these ideas? And I'm like, whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. We just want to be different. And uh, every day, even, I mean, salute to underwear night drew like 300 people. If the media showed up and about 200 fans, but it, it, it was fun. And I think, you know, a lot of times I, I talk to businesses, I go, what's your story? What stories are you creating? And the amount of stories we created that first couple of years in Gastonia, I'll never forget because it was so different and so unique. So that's what got me going. You know, what are we going to do next? And seeing how the fans react to it. What was the vision in your head that you were going for? What was the goal that kind of pushed you on the vision of like when you're like, man, if I can just achieve that, that's what I'm going for. You know, I wish I could go back and say, hey, well, I had this exact plan, this exact vision. You know, now, as I've been owning teams for a few years now, I have a bigger vision of where we want to go and the impact we want to have. But at 23 years old, 24 years old, I was just like, let's get people in the stadium. Let's get them to have fun. Let's improve. And, you know, I think progress is everything and momentum means a lot. So I was like, all right, here's where our revenue was the last year. Here's where our attendance was. And I had a personal goal that first year. Can I double everything? And fortunately, I doubled revenue and I doubled the attendance. And from there, it was like, all right, let's keep going. And that's, that's kind of what kept me going in those early years. And what was your primary marketing channel to double revenue and double attendance? Here's, here's, a, here's a funny story. When um, you know, Facebook just started getting going for businesses back then, and this was in 2008, 2009. And I had a goal. I was like, guys, we're going to get so many Facebook fans. We wanted to give away cruises, free Chick-fil-A. So I was like, we're going to have more Facebook fans than any minor league team in the country and more than the Charlotte Bobcats NBA team. And for six days, we had more fans on Facebook than the Charlotte Bobcats NBA team. Uh, we did this huge push, and we got you know over 5,000 pretty quickly. And we gave away cruises and free Chick-fil-A. Um, so I was using Facebook pretty religiously then before most people were, and that was a big medium for us. Very awesome. So it was word of mouth, people spreading it, and then all the efforts on Facebook. Yeah, you, you know, it's a system. You create attention first. What are you doing that's wild, that's different, that gets the media talking? Then when they get to your ballpark and you get to your business, what's the experience they have then? And then you create the word of mouth. But you have to create attention first because with Savannah Bananas now, we're selling out 60 straight games, two straight seasons. You can't have that unless you didn't get them get their attention in the beginning because now once they come out now, they'll continue to come back. Awesome. Uh, you talked, you mentioned a little bit earlier, a mirror moment. Jesse, what do you mean by that? This is something that I realized very fortunate when I was 23 years old. It's every company should go through this. It's put yourself in your customer's shoes and realize what frustrates you about the industry you're in or frustrates you about the business. And it's very easy to look at, you know, why did Netflix take over Blockbuster? Because Blockbuster frustrated you, the inconvenience, the late fees, just the whole experience, going there to get your favorite movie and you couldn't even get it. Netflix said, we're limiting that. We're not getting rid of the late fees. That was frustrating. Same thing with the cab industry. What did Uber and Lyft do? Any great industry or any industry leader, they look at that. And so for me, I realized for most people, baseball is long, slow, and boring. And when people come to the ballpark, they hate that they get nickel and dimes. $10 for this, $5 this, $5 for this. So we said, all right. Let's go the opposite of that. Let's make it nonstop entertainment with promotions. Let's make it quicker. Let's make it fun. And let's have an all-inclusive ticket. That includes all your food, your burgers, your hot dogs, your chicken, your soda, your water, your ticket, everything for just $15. And you take away all those friction points. And that's how you can create a perfect experience. So when anyone I'm talking to a business or I'm speaking in front of a group, what's frustrating about your industry? Whether it's real estate, architecture, accounting, law firms. It's very easy. Like I talked to my buddy who's a lawyer. And I'm like, I hate every time I talk to you, the longer I talk to you, the more money you make. Can we just get a set fee? Like, let's eliminate that so I can feel like I want to call you, you know? And, and there's little things. There's ways to fix that. If you look at any industry, the restaurant industry, I hate going to the restaurants and then no one even greets me. I'm sitting there waiting. No one thanks me. Enough. There's little things. And that's, I think that's a great starting mo moment. And that's the mirror moment. Mm. That's fantastic. So you're, you're with the Gastonia Grizzlies. How long were you with them? And tell us how you transitioned and came up with the, you know, moved into the opportunity with the Savannah Bananas. Sure. So I was a GM in Gastonia from 2007 to 2010. Then I jumped into the ownership. I had, I had some shares. And then I bought my partner out, bought Ken out in 2014. And that was when I proposed to my wife and got married at our stadium back in 2014. 
And we own uh, Gastonia until recently. We just sold it because Savannah had become much bigger than we even anticipated. And also, uh, my wife and I just welcomed our first son two months ago. And traveling back and forth five hours between teams is very challenging with a new family. Um, so basically, 2014 and then 2015, um, long story short, I proposed on the field in the last game of the season, the yellow tuck. She said yes. She surprised me with a trip to Savannah the next weekend. And we came down here, fell in love with the city, and went to this minor league ballpark that we're at now, the most majestic, epic, beautiful stadium in the world, 80 degrees, a perfect night. And we walked in, the professional team was playing there, and there was less than 500 fans in the stadium. And I looked around, I said, where is everybody? And so at that point on, I called the commissioner of the league. I said, if this team ever leaves, we're coming to Savannah. And he goes, all right, I'll give you the first claim to it. And we found out that they weren't getting the support they wanted, so they needed a new stadium. So they left, called the city, called the commissioner, and we showed up on October 4th, 2015. Wow. So you actually didn't, you didn't take over an existing team. You actually built a team from scratch. Brand new. Yep. Yep. Brand new. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I get asked that question a lot. Like, how do you, you know, young buy teams? And it's like, you take on a lot of debt, an outrageous amount of debt. And that's what we did. We took on a, a serious amount of debt and paid the league uh, expansion fees and came down here with nothing. Yeah. Who, who, I just curious, who finances that for you? <laughs> like, do you go into a bank and say, hey, by the way, we're, we're starting a baseball team? Any, any bank I can find and any credit card I can max out. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how we started. And because it, it's, you know, most minor league teams fail. Most minor league teams aren't profitable. They're, they're struggling. It's tough to make ends meet, especially here in Savannah. No minor league team had ever had success from a, an attendance and revenue standpoint. So uh, we clawed our way to, to, to saving some money. But, you know, as you mentioned if you, reading, in reading the book, you know, in just a few months, we were completely out of our money. And we had to create even bigger attention to find a way to get the community to buy into us. What was going through your head? You talk about in the book being in an apartment with your wife and it's just not a very nice place. You know, you're in this new opera. You have this huge responsibility, a lot of weight on your shoulders. What was the self-talk in your head, Jesse, that was getting you just to push on through that and come out on the other side? It was my wife. And I think no matter what you go into, you need someone that has, that supports you. I was going through doubt. I mean, really, we... We went through all the money that we had. You know, we got a call in January of 2016 that we're completely out of money. We overdrafted our account. We had nothing left. We had to sell our dream house. We had to empty out our savings account. And my wife kept saying, Jesse, we, we did it in Gastonia. We can do it here. And she kept believing and telling me. And, and I was struggling because I had a responsibility to our employees more than anything. I wanted to make sure they got paid every single week. So we mortgaged our life. We got an airbed in the tiniest, grossest house you could ever imagine. We slept with our socks on because the floor was so disgusting. Cockroaches landed on my face. I mean, it was, again, just two and a half, three years ago. And that's what we went through. But, you know, I only shared that with our president of our team. And watching his face, I could tell he was in all. And he's like, I'm going to make sure this is the shortest, tough experience you have. We're going to make this work. And uh, we had a great buy-in from him and the staff. And within a few months, the bananas came out and things started taking off. Okay. So what was, what was the reason why you weren't bringing in revenue during those early days? Was that just part of the startup process that you just needed that time to recruit the players and get everything set up? Or was there a little bit of spinning the wheels, like things aren't quite working, we have to fine tune them? I don't think anyone in Savannah believed in us. I mean, and, and I don't think they had a reason to believe in us. You know, you need to give somebody a reason to care. And they didn't care about us. Uh, there was minor league baseball, professional baseball. We were a lower level. I mean, college summer baseball. Why would they expect us to be successful? And so we came in with all these ideas, dancing players and all you can eat tickets and all these great things. And it was crickets. I mean, they could care less. And so it, it was a point where we just had to come up with something to get their attention and come big. And that's why we came up, not just the name Savannah Bananas, but the whole entire marketing behind it and creating attention. So they'd be like, all right, these guys are different. They're not like that former team that was here previously. So what was the marketing behind it? Tell me about that, what you did to make that impact, to finally get that attention and kind of start that wheel going. So we did a name the team contest, which most teams do, you know, to get the community buying. We got about a thousand names. Uh, only one was Savannah Bananas. Hundreds of things like the Spirits and the Seagulls and the Ports and just generic names. And when we looked at that, we said, this could be crazy. And that's when we started thinking was like, all right, go Bananas, a mascot named Split, a senior citizen dance team called the Banana Nanas. Promotions where we throw bananas from the top deck in people's pants. And it's called banana in the pants. I mean, we thought of the most ridiculous things. We're like, we could really roll with this. And it just sounded good. We thought about the logo and the whole market. And we we're like, let's do this and let's just keep rolling with it. And how can we 
create a system of attention every couple months, doing different things like our breakdancing first base coach, the banana band. We have a 30-piece pep band in our games. And we started thinking about all that. And we're like, let's just go with it. And on February 25th, 2016, we rolled with it. And nationally, it went viral. I mean, we were number one trending on Twitter. Locally, we got crucified, as you mentioned. People were like, you guys are failers. You guys are going to fail. You're an embarrassment. The owner should be thrown out of town. But here's the big thing. We had people were talking about us. And I hate that. I don't like that saying, you know, no publicity, uh, bad publicity is, you know, it's what like, no publicity is bad publicity or whatever. And, you know, uh, it's okay to get negative publicity. But I do feel people do play it's too safe. And I, I believe in embracing criticism. And so we did something that was a little polarizing, but it got everybody talking. And that's what created the brand momentum that we needed. Yep. And how long did it take from that initial launch to finally for you to feel like, okay, no, this is working. This is happening. We have, this is going to work out. That night. I mean, we, what, what happened was, I mean, literally we were doing orders every couple seconds, merchandise orders from all over the world. It was unbelievable. We had no clue what to do. And our first shipment of t-shirts came in earlier the week and bananas was spelled wrong with too many N's. So we had no clue what we were doing. But Emily kept refreshing our computer and it was like order after order after order. Within a few an hour, we sold to 44 states and six countries. And I was like, this brand is bigger than I even expected. And, and we didn't know what to do. So the next day, we're calling in our staff's like girlfriends and fiancés and wives to come in and help us. And we just laid out on an Excel sheet hundreds of merchandise orders that we had to fulfill. And I was like, if this many people are talking about us all over the world, we're going to be okay. And so that was, that was the moment. Where did the merchandise orders come from? How did they hear about you? It, because it went viral. It was number one trending on Twitter. You know, it was on ESPN. It was on SportsCenter, USA Today, Today Show, Sporting News, Sports Illustrated. It was just all over. Because again, it was different. The Savannah Bananas was a different name than what most teams were used to. And so people were making fun of it. Even the people, I loved when the news people were like, oh, what a dumb name. I was like, great, you're talking about it. This is good. So it was fun. Oh, have you seen the movie, uh, The Greatest Showman? <laughs> it's one of my favorites. P.T. Barnum is one of my biggest mentors. I was about to say, you know, the, with, with the focus on P.T. Barnum and you talking about wanting to turn this into a circus, um, I'm just curious about your experience watching that movie, connecting with that, and maybe some insight on your own personal journey versus his. Hmm. I love it. And I've read probably four or five P.T. Barnum books. I've studied him immensely. I love, love what he's done. And I thought of the movie and a lot of people questioned it. They came to me and goes, Jesse, I know you know P.T. very well. I'll go, oh yeah, me and him are like this. Like he died a hundred years ago. But uh, they said, what are your thoughts on the movie? I go, it's exactly how he would have done it. Because here's the reality. A lot of things that happened in the movie weren't true. They weren't the reality. But all P.T. can't hear about was putting on the biggest show. And he was a showman through and through, and he would have wanted the exact same way. So I watched, left that movie, and I was like, perfect. You know, the choreography, the dancing, the singing, that was his big thing. He said, something terrible happens without promotion, nothing. And that movie was really, I thought, in the spirit of P.T. Barnum, and it's living on. The soundtrack has gone viral and everything, and uh, I think it's a testament to what he did. And I, you know, I think that's a big thing about marketing and promotion. Don't question the details. Focus on the big picture and focus on what you're trying to accomplish. And what he did was he accomplished those feelings of excitement, of emotion, of getting kids to feel wonder. And I think that's what the movie did. And that's how I think of it. I always say, all right, we're going to give away um, a porta potty at this game. We're going to give away a colon cleansing. I don't focus on the details. I focus up here on the big picture. What's going to be, is, are the, is the crowd going to laugh? How are they going to respond? Are they going to be shocked? And then luckily we have a great staff that could focus on implementing these crazy ideas. So... I mean, that, that's great for Jess. I mean, Jesse has a big personality. He has a cool yellow tux. You know, he's he's naturally outgoing. But little old me, you know, I'm just I'm just an architect, and and you know, I it's I'm professional. You know, Jesse, how does someone find that in themselves? Well, I think the first thing is that word professional. I think that should be eliminated from vocabulary. Here, here's the challenge I have with professional. Does anyone come home and say, honey, you won't believe I met the most professional guy today. He was just so professional. I went to the most professional company. I think uh, professionalism is overrated. I think weird and unique wins. So first of all, I have an issue with professionalism, but I understand what you're saying. And it's a great question because I don't expect anyone to wear a yellow tux. I don't expect anyone to go over the top and be animated. I expect people hopefully to amplify what they're the best at. And it's amplify your strengths. I, I believe everyone has something that makes them stand out. It's the best version of themselves. And what is that? What do they light up on? What are the things during the day that they lose track of time instead of where most people are watching a clock throughout the day? 
And I've realized that with myself, the things that I absolutely love doing during the day, it's being on stage, it's promoting, it's working with fans, doing operations. I, I'm terrible at that. I stay away from it. But, you know, there's a difference, you know, it's, it's, it's between what you're the best at, how do you stand out, and also your business. So, again, if you're start talking about your business, or the one thing I look at is, hey, the easiest way to stand out is provide the best possible fan experience. And I would call it our customers fans. So we look at every detail. What is the best possible fan experience? If you do that, you will stand out over everyone else. And I think a lot of people focus too much on their product and not on their customers. And I believe love your customers more than your product. And that's the easiest way we stand out. Yes, I wear the yellow tux. Yes, we have crazy things going at the ballpark. But everything we're focused on is that fan's first experience. And that's how I believe we really succeed and how any company can. And that's a wrap. To discover how to create a firm with more fun and less fires, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for a free online training on how to grow your firm without being chained to your desk, really how to get to that next level from sole practitioner to hiring staff to growing to something greater than yourself. To discover how to market your firm and win better projects, I invite you to sign up for my next free design for marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Once again, this is a free online training. There's no charge for that. You can enjoy it in the comfort of your home or your office. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. You can get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage Glass, our second sponsor for today's show, uh, manufactures a special kind of glass that tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views of the outdoors. So the future is here. Sage Glass gives you the freedom to design beautiful buildings unconstrained by the sun. You can visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment for yourself. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.